This is going to be a video about chi-squared goodness of fit. This is a, a less common form of chi-squared, so I don't think that this is really going to be on the AP as much. If anything, it might be one multiple choice. I don't think it's going to be a free response. If you do get a chi-squared free response, I think it's going to be the other video I did, which is the chi-squared test for association slash independence. This has shown up here and there as one multiple choice, so let's see what we got. So you know the M&M's company has all the different colors of M&M's, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And it turns out that they advertise that there's different percent breakdown of each color. So they claim that 12.5% are brown, 12.5% are green, red, etc. And that is the advertised percent breakdown of M&M's. So this is what they claim to be true. This claim is what is expected or uh, predicted for the breakdowns of each. And now we actually have a sample. So this sample is of 60, and this is the observed values that we got from our sample, observed or actual values. So as you can see, we have brown, red, yellow, green, orange, and we want to see are these amounts that we got, are the proportions consistent with what the company advertises is predicted. So the null hypothesis, basically you have a lot of different proportions here, whereas with the two prop Z test, the pool one, we just had like P brown and P green. So our null hypothesis would be like P brown equals P green, and the alternative would be P brown is greater than P green or whatever. In this case, we have six colors. So we're not going to write down all of them here because that would be annoying. We could, but we don't have to. So what we could do instead is write down all the proportions of colors are consistent with the advertised proportions by the company. So if you wanted to, you could really write down like the true proportion of brown should be 0.125. The true proportion of green should be 0.125, etc. Okay. And you would write all six, but you it's fine to just write all the proportions are the same as what they advertise. And then the alternative would be at least one of the proportions of colors is different than the advertised. And basically, if one of these colors is different, then it's going to throw the whole distribution off. So is the actual distribution what they advertise, or is it a little off from what they claim? Okay. So as you can see, we have a total of 60, and those are my actual counts or my observed counts. Now we also have to calculate our expected counts. Our expected or predicted counts are what we would predict based on the proportions that they advertise. So it says underneath, how many candies of each color should we expect to get? So for example, brown. If there's a total in the sample of 60 brown, if he wanted to calculate the proportion or the expected amount of brown, uh, he would just multiply the N times the P. So in this case, N is 60 and P for brown was 0.125. So you would just do 60 times 0.125 and that would be 7.5. So basically he can expect to get 7.5 brown in his bag. But he didn't get 7.5 brown. If you look, he got 12 brown in his bag, okay? So what's predicted or expected is not necessarily what actually happened. So similarly here, we can calculate the proportions of uh, the expected amount, sorry, the expected counts for every single color, okay? So we're gonna do the same exact thing. We're gonna take the total in the sample, 60, and we're going to multiply by the advertised percent by the company. So if you look back on the top, it says that they claim that 12.5% uh, are also red. So then if you do N times P, 60 times 0.125, we should expect to get 7.5 red. Orange. 
we're going to do 60 times the advertised orange, uh, 25%. So that's 0.125. So let's do 60 times 0.25 or 25%. And we get 15. So we can expect to get 15 red in the bag, yellow, blue, and green. Yellow, they said 0.125 again. That's 7.5 yellow. Blue, 25. So that's going to be 15 blues and green. Uh, 0.125 again. So that's going to be 7.5. So these are my expected counts or my predicted counts. So just remember, expected and predicted are kind of like the same thing. And that's not necessarily what actually happened. So when we draw our expected counts, we can write them in our um, little table, if we like, right next to the observed. Or you can make a separate row, if you like, uh, called predicted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my counts here and I'm going to call these counts observed and then I'm going to create a new row here called predicted or expected and then I'm going to put in in this row what I got for these so I got brown 7.5 red 7.5 yellow 7.5 Green, 7.5, orange, 15, 15. And if you look across, they should total up to the same total 60. Unless there's a little round off error, it might be some round off error. So now we have the observed and we have the expected counts. So it's what down below it shows what I just did was to get my expected counts, I did n times p. And that should sound familiar because that's actually the formula for the expected value of a binomial setting, n times p. There is a finite number of M&Ms, n, 60, and then you're multiplying by the uh, advertised proportion, p. So technically now we will want to see if um, – they're graphing this in the form of a side-by-side -side, uh, bar graph, it looks like, and they want to see are the observed counts equal to the expected. So even when you look on this table here and you look across, you see I got 12 brown and I was expected to get 7.5. I got 3 red and I was expected to get 7.5. So they don't really look like they're consistent with what they advertised. So basically, you know that we're going with the p-value here because it says how likely is it that the difference is as large or larger than what we got, like in our sample, would it occur by chance or basically is it random? So everything we're doing is always involves finding a p-value and the p-value is the chance of the thing that we got from the sample happening by chance or not. So to calculate this, what we do is calculate what's called a chi-squared test statistic. Chi-squared is denoted by the letter X. It's a lowercase x squared or a capital X, dependent on if you're doing only one cell or the total of all the cells. Some people call it chi, I call it chi. So to get the um, chi-squared test statistic, basically what you're going to try to do is you want to know how off is your observed count from what's expected. So basically, if your observed equals your expected, then when you do observed minus expected, you're going to get zero because there's going to be no difference between the observed and the expected. And your numerator here is going to be zero. But if your observed and your expected are totally different, then you're going to have a large difference here in your numerator for observed minus expected. And then when you square it, it's going to be even bigger. So the formula for the chi-squared test statistic is on the reference sheet, and it is located in the um, toward the beginning where it says um, 
and friendship statistics, I think underneath the confidence interval, if you look in Roman numeral three, it says standardized test statistic, confidence interval formula, and then it says chi-score test statistic equals summation, observed minus expected squared over expected. So remember this symbol here is called a summation. Summation means and them all up. And then what you're going to do is take every observed value, take away the expected, and divide by the expected count. But you have to square them because some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, and you want to get rid of the negatives. And then you add them all up to get the total chi-squared test statistic for the question. So basically, you don't necessarily have to show all six of these. There were six colors for the question, um, red, orange, yellow, green, whatever. So it looks like we just did the first term and then a plus sign and then a dot, dot, dot and the last term here. So that's kind of nice because you don't really have to do it fully out. You're just showing the grader that you understand what's going on here. So remember on the AP, they want you to write the formula in symbols. So you can write observed minus expected squared over expected and then um, summation to show that you're adding them all up and then you can write the first term plus sign dot 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 last term so if you look back at my data they did 12 minus 7.5 so if you look it looks like they probably did according to them they did brown um, observed minus expected squared over expected so they did 12 minus 7.5 squared over 7.5 and then they probably did the last term, which was blue, 20 minus 15 squared over 15. Let's see. Okay, it looks like that's what they did. Now, how do I get my chi-squared test statistic in the calculator? Okay, this is what they got. I'm going to show you how to get it in the calculator. So to do this, you press stat, and you go over to um, tests, and you go up or down until you get to the letter D for dog or D for delightful. So when you choose chi-squared goodness of fit, G-O-F stands for goodness of fit. And I want you to think about like, how good is the fit of our percent breakdown of our colors of our M&Ms compared to what was expected? So it's gonna ask you where your observed counts and where your expected counts. So you actually have to put these in, in L1 and L2. So to do that, we got to go out of here and press stat edit, and I have data in L1. So I could hit up and hit clear enter, or if you want, you could press second plus and choose number four, clear your list to clear your list. And then you press stat edit, and you're going to enter your observed counts in L1 and your expected counts in L2. So I'm going to look back at my table here. And I'm going to put my observed counts here all of these in L1, and I'm going to put my expected counts in L2. Okay, so L1, I'm going to put in 12, 13, nope, 3, 7, 9, 9, 12, 3, 7, 9, 9, 20. So I should have 6 total, and then the expected counts, 7.5, 7.5, 7.5, 7 7.5, 15, 15. I could kind of do these by hand if I wanted to. I could actually do observe minus expected squared over expected for each one because there's only six. It's kind of easier. But I'm going to let the calculator do its magic now. So I'm going to go to stat, go back to test, go up or down until you get to the goodness of fit test, which is letter D. Choose D. And then your observed are in L1, your expected are in L2, but how do we get our degrees of freedom for this? Okay, so to get our degrees of freedom for this, you have to do, usually it was N minus 1. For this one, you have to do number of categories minus 1. So there are six categories of colors, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 colors. So you're going to do 6 minus 1, which is 5, because there's six total categorical variables of colors minus 1. So it's five. And now we could hit calculate or draw. I'll hit calculate first. And then it's going to give me my chi-square test statistic on the top. And then it's going to give me my p-value underneath it. Okay. So if you look down here, notice this matches. The chi-square test statistic is 9.8. And that's what they got, 9.8. And then they got a p-value of 0.08. 
0.081. So let me write that down. So notice underneath here, they also have, it says CNTRB, and you're probably like, what's that? That would be if they did all the individual chi-square test statistics one by one for each color, what they are. So 2.7, 2.7, if you go to the right, 0.033, whatever. That's actually them doing um, observed minus expected squared over expected for each one. So for example, if I had done the first cell, which was 12 minus 7.5 squared over 7.5, I should get 2.7. I'll show you. Observe 12 minus expected 7.5 squared over expected. This is the first cell, which is brown, 2.7. So that is the chi-square test statistic for each cell, brown through blue. Also, if we go back and do stat and we go back to test and we choose goodness of fit test again, and if we go down to draw, you're going to see a picture of the distribution. And notice it is skewed right. So first thing is I got to turn my plot off here. Let me go back. It is skewed right. And the reason why it's skewed right is because chi squared is squared. So all the negatives get squared and become positive. So unlike z-scores that you could get a negative z-score or a positive z-score or a zero z-score, chi squared is always going to be squared. So it's always only going to be positive chi squared scores. So notice here, if I wanted to sketch it, I would sketch it out and I would label my p-value here at 0 0.0811. All right, so we're going to write what is the shape skewed right. Okay, so now if we go back to our p-value, let's see if we can make our decision. Remember, when p is low, reject HO. How low? Less than the alpha level. So if alpha was 0 0.05, would I have rejected the null? Is 0 0.081 less than 0 0.05? The answer is no. 0 0.081 is greater than 0 0.05. So I would fail to reject the null. So if you go back to your null, remember the null I said was all the proportions that we got for the M&Ms are actually the same or consistent with what was advertised. And the alternative is that at least one of the proportions is different, meaning the percent breakdown of colors is different. So because my p-value was 0 0.08, I can't reject the null. So I say I fail to reject the null hypothesis, and thus I cannot claim that the alternative is true, that at least one of the proportions is different and that the M&M company was lying to us about their advertised proportions. So even though I got a sample that looks slightly different than what was advertised, it could really just be that it was a sample, one sample, and doesn't really represent the overall samples of all the M&Ms. So here, these are the things that I just went over with you. I've just, it's, it's here for you in print. So the chi-square distri distribution is always skewed right because there are no negative critical values. Um, to get the degrees of freedom, I just went over a number of categories minus one. So I did six colors minus one. In this case, there are six color categories. So I did six minus one to get my five degrees of freedom. And then remember the definition of a p-value. It's the probability of getting a value, a sample value, as large or larger than whatever the value was. So because we got 0 0.08, when the null is true, by the way. So the, the chance of getting the value that you got when the null is true. Oh, so the chi-squared value we got, sorry, was um, 9.8. So the probability, if you look at the picture, of the chi-squared value of 9.8 is here, and the p-value that we got is here, which was 0.08. They're showing you the table method. Uh, I don't really like the table method as much, but you could do the table method. You would look at the degrees of freedom of 5. This is a different table, by the way. This is called table C, chi-squared table, and you would look for um, the look across at df5 which i showed you how to get just now 
and you would look for your chi-squared test statistic value, which was 9.8. <laughs> 9 9.8 is located between 9.24 and 11.07. .07. So if you look up with your eyes to the p-value, that will correspond to something between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. And that's what we got when we did our p-value. We got 0 0.08, which is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. Okay? So if you want to know what conditions we have to check for chi-squared, again, I don't think that this is going to be on your free response, but you always want to check SRS and 10N is less than the population of interest. But the last one is all the expected counts have to be greater than or equal to 5. And if you look back at our expected counts, I think they were all greater than 5. So this is usually met if your sample size is large enough. Okay, so there are a few questions that have shown up as the multiple choice, only multiple choice. If you scroll through your document, <coughs> there's a few here. Um, I'm going to do one, and then the video is going to end because I think the bell is going to ring. Let's see. So here's one. This is number two. The table below shows historical data from the distribution of number of customers in half-hour time periods who visit the electronics store. For example, 25% usually show up when zero, uh, no customers are there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is what's advertised. Bye. To investigate if the distribution has changed, the number of customers who visit the electronics store was recorded for 50 randomly selected periods. The results are shown below. Okay, so this is what is expected expected percent breakdown or uh, advertise expected or predicted okay and then if you look down below this is based on a sample of 50 so this is what actually happened this should total 50 in the sample okay so it says a chi-score test for goodness of fit so that's the kind we're doing gof for goodness of fit was conducted to determine whether the data provide convincing evidence that the distribution has changed. The test statistic was 10.13, and the p-value was 0.0175, which of the following is true. So if p is low, will we reject the null? We would, because p is less than 0.05. So reject the null, and we say that there is evidence against the null for the alternative. Remember, the alternative says that there is evidence that the current distribution is different than the alternative. So the answer should be A, at a significance level of 0.05, the data provides convincing evidence that the current distribution is different. Okay, so the null would be that the distribution is the same as what was advertised. And the alternative would be the distribution is different than what's advertised. So we're going to reject the null, and we're going to conclude in favor of the alternative because the P was 0.0175, which is less than 0.05.